shopping, you can push your shopping buggy out to the car. Many malls also have buggies or strollers for pushing small children along. There can be a lot of walking in a trip to the mall. In fact, some people go to the mall just to exercise. A half dozen laps around the mall every morning amount to a pretty good workout. However, there are always places to sit down when you get tired. Most malls have a food court. This is an open area with a lot of tables and chairs. Usually, there are a dozen or more small restaurants circled around the food court. The department stores often have full size restaurants. Malls have large parking lots. Unlike downtown, you don't pay to park at the mall. On a busy day, finding a space close to the store can be a challenge. Many people go to the malls when the weather is bad. During wintry weather, the malls are busy. Likewise, in really hot summer weather, people go to the malls to get cool. The climate there is always the same. People don't go to malls just to shop, they also go to meet people. Usually, you bump into friends and neighbors there. Old people, as well as teenagers, go there to see friends. Usually, the malls sponsor special events. With lots to see and do, malls are a popular place to hang out. Stephen Foster, American Songwriter. Before radio and television, movies and recordings, entertainment was often a family or community matter. Someone in the family could play a musical instrument, or a neighborhood musician would play for small gatherings. In addition, there would be traveling groups of musicians, actors, and clowns who would go from town to town. In 19th century United States, one of the most popular forms of entertainment was the minstrel show. Black slavery was still permitted in the southern states until 1865. Even after that date, the lives of many blacks working on large farms or plantations did not change much. They did hard physical labor in the fields, had little control over their lives, and very little time to relax with their friends. Foster, who was born in 1826, made this situation the background for many of his songs. White musicians would try to imagine the feelings of black men and women working on the plantations. They would write songs in the dialect or speech patterns that they thought black slaves used. In these songs, the black people would be talking about their hardships, falling in love, playing music and dancing. And finally, growing old and dying. White performers would blacken their faces and sing these songs to white audiences. They would play musical instruments like the banjo, a small four string guitar, which black people played often. As a small boy, Stephen Foster had sometimes been taken to a black church by his family's black servant, Olivia Pies. Here, he first heard the melodies that inspired his own songs. Only a couple of Foster's songs are based directly on Negro spirituals. But many of his songs have the natural simplicity and emotional power of folk songs. The youngest member of a large family, Foster showed his musical talent at an early age. He played the flute, violin, and piano. Growing up in an energetic business family, Stephen was expected to become a businessman. And for a while, he worked as a bookkeeper. All his spare time, however, was spent writing songs. Foster attended minstrel shows and tried to get the performers to sing his songs. Sometimes the performers would steal his songs and publish them under their own names. Copyright laws were weak and rarely enforced, so some music publishers would just go ahead and publish a song without paying the songwriter. Since Foster hoped to make a living as a songwriter, this was a problem. Foster's first hit song was Oh Susanna, published in 1848. It became popular with the thousands of men from all over the United States who were heading west to the California Gold Rush of 1849. Unfortunately, As an unknown songwriter, Foster received no money from his early songs. He seems to have given them outright to the music publishers just to establish his reputation. Foster's name, however, was soon widely known, and in 1849 he was able to afford to give up bookkeeping and marry the daughter of a Pittsburgh physician. During the next five years, he earned a moderately good income from songwriting. In 1851, a daughter, Marion, was born. Foster wrote many of his best known songs at this time Old Folks at Home in 1851, My Old Kentucky Home in 1853, and Jeannie with a Light Brown Hair in 1854. Difficulties in Foster's marriage began fairly soon. These may have been partly due to his strange work habits. He spent days locked in his room working on his songs. Then he would rush out with his materials to the local music store, presumably to test out the songs on his friends. He also became more and more addicted to alcohol. Eventually, his wife and daughter left him. Foster died alone in a rooming house in 1864. Immigrants to the United States brought their traditional folk songs with them. However, there are very few typically American songs. Foster provided many songs that express the life of 19th century USA. 
His songs were easy to sing and were popular with nearly everyone. In a sense, Foster helped to create roots for American popular music. Sunday Morning at Church Every Sunday is a holiday or half-holiday in North America. Some stores may be open, but banks, offices, and government services are usually closed. Sunday closing has a Christian origin. Christians believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead on a Sunday morning, so Sunday is known as the Lord's Day. About 30 or 35 percent of North Americans attend church regularly on Sunday mornings. About the same percentage attend church occasionally. At Christmas and Easter, the churches are very full as people celebrate these two important holy days. Nearly everybody goes to church at least three times. They are baptized or dedicated as a child. Most people are married in a church, and many people are buried after a church service. Church services are usually held Sunday mornings, often at 11 o'clock a.m., although there may also be evening services provided. Most services last an hour. Their purpose is to worship God and to help people focus on religious and moral beliefs. The service is led by a pastor, minister, or priest, who usually also looks after the people and the business of the church. It is the pastor who delivers the sermon, a 20-minute talk on a religious or moral matter. Usually, members take part in the service. They may lead the singing, read from the Bible, offer prayers for the congregation, take up the collection, or act as ushers. Most churches also have a choir, a group of singers who lead in singing the hymns. There are many cultural traditions connected to going to church. People normally wear their best clothing and try to be on their best behavior. Talking or making noise in church is usually considered bad. This is why children often have a separate children's church or Sunday school, where they can be more like children. The Sunday service is the main weekly event in many churches. But nowadays, there are a growing number of large super churches which organize all kinds of activities for their members. These churches usually have large buildings and a large staff to plan and lead various activities. These might include prayer group, counseling and social work, youth programs, social action, fundraising events, etc. Many large churches have gymnasiums for regular sports activities. At the same time, house churches are also becoming very popular. These are small groups of people who meet at private homes. Sometimes a group will meet in a house until they have the money to buy a church. But many people say they prefer to meet in small groups. That way they get to know one another better. Then they feel comfortable sharing their problems and successes and praying for each other. Some say that large churches can interfere with getting close to God and other Christians. There are many different brands of Christianity. The largest single denomination in North America is Roman Catholicism. One large Christian brands are Episcopalian, Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal, Lutheran, and Presbyterian. All have slightly different traditions and beliefs. Although in the past these groups have often been in conflict with one another, today they usually cooperate in working together for their members and the community. Thanksgiving Day Thanksgiving Day has a special meaning for Americans. Many holidays were brought along from Europe by the early settlers and didn't change very much. But Thanksgiving takes on a special shape in North America. That is because of the Thanksgiving celebrated by the early pilgrim settlers in Massachusetts in 1621. These early settlers were from England, and they were known as Puritans. This is because they wanted to purify the state religion of England. They felt that the churches were more concerned with politics and customs than God and worship. They were also called pilgrims because they were willing to travel to other countries in order to worship God the way they wanted to. When the English government put some of the pilgrims in jail, the rest left England and went to the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, they could have their own churches. However, it was hard to earn a living there, and at first they didn't know the language. In time, the English king learned where they were and tried to have them arrested, so they thought of another plan. Pilgrim leaders like William Brewster attempted to raise money to start a colony in North America. They would have to borrow money and pay it back later. Thirty members of the Pilgrim Church in the Netherlands voted to sail to America with their families. They returned to England and set sail on two ships, the Speedwell and the Mayflower. When the Speedwell appeared unable to cross the ocean, both ships returned to England. All who still wanted to sail crowded into the Mayflower and set sail on September 6, 1620. Many of the passengers became sick during the long voyage, and some died. They encountered fierce storms because they were sailing late in the season. After 66 days, they sighted the sandy shoreline of Cape Cod in present-day Massachusetts. 
There was disagreement between the pilgrims and others on board ship about what to do. So first they had to agree to a common form of a government and elect a governor. Since winter was coming, they decided to stay on the ship till spring. About half of the remaining settlers died during the first winter. When the Mayflower sailed back to England, only about 50 settlers were left. Nearly half of these were children. There were Indians in Massachusetts, but at first they were not friendly. They shot arrows at the settlers. But one day, a friendly Indian named Samoset came to visit them. He spoke English and could tell them many things. He brought another Indian named Squanto, who showed the pilgrims how to plant corn. Eventually, their chief, Massasoit, came, and he promised to keep peaceful relations with the settlers. All spring and summer of 1621, the pilgrims worked hard in the fields. They also finished building houses and barns. In the fall, they were delighted to see that the corn and vegetables had grown well. They decided to have a Thanksgiving feast and invited their Indian friends. On the day of the feast, Chief Massasoit came with 90 Indians. There were turkeys, deer meat, and fish to eat. The feast lasted three days. When the food ran low, the Indians went out to shoot more birds and animals. The pilgrims and Indians competed in races, wrestling, shooting, and other games. The pilgrims addressed prayers and thanks to God for providing food, shelter, freedom of religion, and friendly Indians in this new land. Ever since 1621, Thanksgiving celebrations include memories of that special occasion. Today, turkeys, cranberries, corn, and squash are usually part of the Thanksgiving meal. In the United States, Thanksgiving Day is a national holiday. It's celebrated every year on the fourth Thursday in November. In Canada, where the harvest is earlier, Thanksgiving is celebrated on the second Monday of October. The celebration always includes giving thanks for the good things that people have received, especially for food and families. Along with this goes the Thanksgiving meal, when so many good things are eaten. The Calgary Stampede The Wild West as we know it from Hollywood Westerns did not last a long time. Its height was from about 1865 to 1885 for only 20 years. By 1885, there were railways across the plains, fences had been built around farms and ranches, and lawmen were on the lookout for any troublemakers. Not only that, but by 1885, nearly all the buffalo had been killed and most of the Indians were on reservations. Still, the Wild West had captured the imagination of the reading public. A former buffalo hunter and Indian scout, Buffalo Bill Cody, decided to take advantage of his fame as a cowboy. In 1883, he organized Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show and toured North America and Europe. Alberta, Canada had been the last part of the Old West to be settled. But by 1912, ranching was being replaced by farming. The city of Calgary was itself becoming a commercial and industrial center. Old-timers looked back fondly to the old days of cowboys and Indians. In 1908, the Miller Brothers' Wild West show visited Calgary. One of the cowboys, Guy Wiedek, talked to local businessmen about putting on a rodeo and the Wild West show. Eventually, four Calgary businessmen put up $25,000 each to finance the event. Wiedek was a good organizer. He advertised all over the U.S. and the Canadian West for cowboys and rodeo riders to come. And with $25,000 in prize money, people came from as far away as Mexico. Wiedek was able to persuade the Canadian government to let large numbers of Indians leave their reservations to attend. In fact, the Indians were a big part of the program. The main rodeo events were bronco riding, bareback riding, women's bronco riding, steer roping, and bulldogging. These events were based on things that working cowboys actually did. But to make them harder, special bucking horses were brought in. One horse named Cyclone had never been ridden long by anyone. He had thrown 127 riders in a row. Most of the rodeo cowboys came from the United States, from Wyoming, Oregon, Oklahoma, Colorado, and Arizona. But there were also Canadian cowboys and some Canadian Indians competing. Queen Victoria's son, the Duke of Connaught, was the Grand Marshal. Many cowboys rode well, but no one could stay on Cyclone. On the sixth and final day, the grounds were muddy from rain, and the horses kept slipping. Cyclone escaped from his handlers and ran around the track. For his last Bronco riding contest, Cyclone's rider would be Tom Three Persons. Three Persons was a blood Indian from southern Alberta. When Three Persons got on Cyclone, the horse would rear up and plunge its head down to throw the rider. Cyclone acted as though it would topple over backwards, but three persons hung on. Then it hurled itself forward with its head almost touching the ground. After a wild ride of several minutes, Cyclone began to tire. The judges declared Tom three persons the winner of the Bucking Bronco event. 
Three Persons was the only Canadian to win a major event at that first Calgary Stampede in 1912. Today, the Calgary Stampede continues to be the largest rodeo and Wild West show in North America. It has many new events and attractions and still attracts the best rodeo riders from all over North America. Video designed by English7Levels.com The Expulsion of the Acadians The history of the Americas, from their discovery by Columbus till the founding of modern nation-states, has been the struggle among European powers for the largest and richest sections of the continents. In particular, England and France have struggled for control of most of North America. Many tragedies and disasters have marked this conflict, but few have been as heart-rendering as the expulsion of the Acadians in 1755. Acadia refers to what are now the maritime provinces of Canada, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, and Nova Scotia. In 1605, a French expedition under De Mont and Champlain established an agriculture settlement at Port Royal in present-day Nova Scotia. Although Port Royal and other colonies had very mixed success, there was a gradual increase of French settlement through the 17th century. By 1710, the French or Acadian population had reached 2,100. In 1710, Port Royal fell to the English, and the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713 confirmed British ownership of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. By this treaty, the Acadians, that is the French-speaking inhabitants, were allowed to stay or leave the country as they pleased. The majority of inhabitants of Acadia were French and were still being influenced by agents from France and Quebec. This made their loyalty to Britain very doubtful in time of war. Governor Phillips attempted to get the Acadians to swear an oath of allegiance to King George of England, and Phillips was able in 1729 to get the French settlers to agree to a modified oath with the understanding that they would not have to fight against the French and their Indian allies. The Acadians remained neutral during the fighting between Britain and France in 1744-45 to in Nova Scotia. In 1749, the British established a new capital for Nova Scotia at Halifax and began to bring in English-speaking settlers. Because of threats from the French and Indians, most of these settlers remained close to Halifax. British skirmishes with the French and Indians continued, and a new war between France and England was approaching. Governor Lawrence decided that it was time to settle the Acadian question. He ordered the Acadians either to take an unqualified oath of allegiance to England or to face expulsion from the colony. At that time, in 1755, there were troops and ships from New England in the area, and it seemed like an opportune time to round up the Acadians and ship them out. When the Acadians refused to take the oath which might oblige them to fight against France, the British rounded up 6,000 of the 8,000 Acadians, burned their homes, and shipped them away to British colonies of Virginia, the Carolinas, and as far away as the mouth of the Mississippi River. Several of the transport ships sank, drowning all on board, and the Acadians died from disease and hardship. Since the expulsion order did not come from London, it has been suggested that Governor Lawrence had personal reasons for the expulsion. He may have been greedy for the land and possessions confiscated from the Acadians. Others say there was the genuine fear for the English position in North America and that Lawrence was only protecting the interests of the colony. Acadians still live in maritime Canada today. Almost 2,000 fled into the woods and eluded the roundup. Another 2,000 Acadians later returned from exile to take the oath of allegiance. Many stories were told of their sufferings. One tale relates to how on the very day of his wedding, a bridegroom was seized by the British and transported from the colony. His bride wandered for many years through the American colonies trying to find him. At last, when she was old, she found him on his deathbed. The shock of finding him and his death soon caused her death. This is the story of Henry W. Longfellow's poem, Evangeline. The Florida Everglades Southern Florida stretches south, dividing the Atlantic Ocean from the Gulf of Mexico. Stretching further south is the Florida Keys. These coral islands are the southernmost part of the United States. Since much of southern Florida is close to sea level, it's very swampy. The famous Everglades are wetlands where tall grass and bunches of trees grow. Part of these swamps has been drained for agricultural land. The soil is rich, and market gardening is an important activity. The Everglades that remain are too wet to be used for farming. The Everglades are a river of grass. The deeper water areas stay wet all year, but the shallower pools dry up in the dry season. Some of the water has been drained off for agricultural purposes, making the Everglades drier. Nonetheless, the best way to travel in this region is by airboats. These high boats can go through water and sail over clumps of grass. 
Besides the wet grasslands, southern Florida has smaller areas of tropical forest. These areas of hardwood trees are called hammocks, and they are rich in animal and plant life. Along much of the coast are mangrove trees, which provide important nesting grounds for wild birds. The Florida Keys stretch 200 miles from Miami southwest. These islands are tropical in climate. Fishing and tourism are important industries. Because of its subtropical nature, the animal and plant life of southern Florida differs from other parts of the United States. Characteristic animals are alligators and crocodiles. Alligators prefer fresh water and usually live inland, while crocodiles live in salt water along the coast. Both animals are considered dangerous. Alligator wrestling is considered a sport for the brave or foolhardy. Probably Florida is the most famous for its birds. At one time, many species were almost extinct. Their long feathers were used on women's hats. Now the law protects them. Florida has at least six species of herons, several egrets, wood storks, white ibises, and cormorants. Characteristic Florida birds are the purple gallinule, the anninga, the limpkin, flamingos, and roseate spoonbills. Many of these birds are notable for their size, coloring, and interesting habits. Notable animals include the key deer, a miniature form of the white-tailed deer. There are also panthers or cougars, bobcats, marsh rabbits, mangrove squirrels, round-tailed muskrats, and the manatee. Naturally, the Everglades are home to many reptiles. Snakes are common, both water snakes and land species. There are four poisonous varieties. Both land and sea turtles abound, and lizards are fairly common. Fishing is a major industry. Sports fishermen go to sea in search of trophies such as marlin, sailfish, and tarpon. Smaller fish are caught commercially. Freshwater sport fish include bass and gar. After many decades of work to protect the animals and plants of the Everglades, the region finally became a national park in 1947. It is the third largest park in the USA and covers one and a half million acres. Within the park live 300 kinds of birds, 30 kinds of mammals, 65 kinds of reptiles and amphibians, and nearly 1,000 species of flowering plants. Of course, it is a major tourist attraction. The Great Walls of China. The Great Wall of China is famous in North America, and many tourists would like to travel there. However, most North Americans don't know very much about Chinese history. That is changing now, as China is becoming an important subject for study in the West. The settled communities of China were targets for nomadic raids since earliest times. For much of its early history, China was not fully unified. However, Shi Huang, who died in 210 B.C., united the whole country. Then he set about defending China from the northern nomads. It seems likely there have been defensive walls in the north before. However, Shi Wang had a wall constructed across the entire north of China. This defensive wall extended for almost 2,000 miles and had 25,000 towers. Such walls were very expensive to build. They also required huge numbers of men to construct them and later to defend them. Even so, the Great Wall did not stop nomadic invasions altogether. Not long after Shi Wang's death, a tribe called the Huns crossed the wall. The emperor Hu Ti, who expanded Chinese power beyond the wall, defeated them. Centuries later, the Mongols to the north of China were united under Genghis Khan. The Mongols attacked China, and Kublai Khan, grandson of Genghis, became the first non-Chinese emperor of China in 1279. Eventually, the Chinese rebelled and overthrew their Mongol rulers. Nonetheless, the Mongols remained a threat. In 1449, they destroyed a Chinese army and captured the emperor. A new Great Wall was begun to keep the Mongols out. This is the wall which tourists visit today and which is pictured on Chinese stamps. Construction continued for 200 years. While some parts were built off packed earth, much of the wall was built of stone, brick, and rubble. This is why it took so long. Stones had to be quarried and bricks baked and carried to the site. Laborers, peasants, soldiers, and criminals were forced to work on the wall. Large and small forts and watchtowers carefully guarded the wall. Nearly a million soldiers were stationed along it. The Chinese defenders lit fires when the enemy was sighted. Plumes of smoke and cannon shots told that the enemy was advancing and how many there were. By 1644, the new wall was almost completed. That same year, however, an internal uprising overthrew the emperor. This revolt was partly caused by the high taxes demanded to pay for the wall. The emperor's men invited the nomadic Manchu tribe to come through the gates in the wall to help put down the revolt. The Manchus came, but they stayed and ruled China for several hundred years.
Since the Manchus ruled both north and south of the wall, they did not care about maintaining it. Many parts fell into disrepair, and some completely disappeared. Today, the parts that remain are a major tourist attraction. The Great Wall of China is one of the wonders of the world, even if it really didn't succeed in its purpose of keeping the northern nomads out of China. The Internet. The first working computers in the 1950s and 1960s were large mainframe machines. In some ways, they were like large calculating machines. The U.S. government, the military, and businesses and institutions used them for specific tasks. For example, they might be used to handle the payroll. As more uses were found for computers, the need to transfer data from one computer to another became a concern. In 1969, the U.S. government sponsored a program to explore ways for computers to transfer data over telephone lines. The first internet was created with four computers linked together. Of course, computer use increased beyond anyone's expectations. Standards were developed that describe how data was to be transferred between computers. A common language for commands and communications emerged. Operating programs such as MS DOS, Unix, Macintosh, and Windows came into existence. The internet quickly expanded beyond government and military uses. The PC became the standard form of computer. Private agencies acted as hosts for internet usage. Around 1982, there were 213 hosts. By 1986, there were 2,300. Today, there are millions. The role of computers expanded so quickly that the USSR, which had discouraged computer use, found itself left behind by the USA. Part of the reason for the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989 was that they had fallen too far behind the United States in high-tech areas to ever catch up. One of the most popular uses of the computer is electronic mail or email. You can send a letter by computer over the internet to anywhere in the world in seconds or less, and it doesn't cost anything extra. Now data can be transferred great distances almost instantaneously. Another major internet use is the World Wide Web. In the early days, all web pages were text only. In the 1990s, it became possible to make web pages interactive and multimedia. Interactive means that readers could click on items on the web page and get more information. They could also communicate directly with the web page owner. Multimedia means that web pages were no longer text only. They could also have graphics, film, video, and audio. This has helped to turn computers into popular entertainment. Nowadays, people spend hours every day surfing the net. However, there are some problems. For some people, computers are addictive. Many businesses are trying to control employees using the net during working hours. Since the internet includes just about every kind of information, not all of it is good. You can find directions on how to become a criminal or a terrorist. There are scam artists who want to cheat you out of money. There are also aggressive. Pornography salesmen, not to mention people who want to kill your computer with viruses. Since the internet is not closely regulated, it's up to individual users to follow computer etiquette. Parents need to supervise their children's use of the net. Although the internet has some disadvantages, many people see the net as one of the greatest invention of modern times. The planetarium. All around the world, stargazing is a popular activity. The night sky lit up with stars is one of the most impressive scenes in nature. Besides its natural beauty, people study the night sky for many reasons. Some believe that they can read the future in the stars. Others think that the stars influence the weather, while some people worship the stars and the planets. There is a problem with stargazing. If the night is cloudy, people on the ground cannot see the stars. Also, bad weather makes being outside at night uncomfortable. Besides, not everybody wants to stay up late at night. A planetarium is an ideal solution to all these problems. A planetarium is usually a large dome-covered building. It has seating like a theater. The program here is a star show. A special projector throws a picture of the night sky on the ceiling of the planetarium theater. Like a movie projector, the planetarium projector can show a constantly changing program. It can show how the stars look right now, how they looked thousands of years ago, and how they will look in the future. Planetariums can be both entertaining and educational. School children can go to learn about the nine planets of the solar system or about the various groupings of stars. Planetariums can teach you how to find the stars and planets yourself when you're out at night. There can also be dramatic showings about changes to the universe over time. This is also a way to view special phenomena like Halley's comet, which only appears once in a lifetime.
Planetarians can also show how ancient people view the skies. Shepherds living out under the sky imagine that groups of stars represented wonderful people and